this this European Super League. So you didn't know what either side had for artillery, what they had for weaponry, how they were going to attack. You didn't know who had the the, the advantage or the disadvantage. Um, and it really felt like the announcement of a war. And we were about to watch it play out publicly where they sort of tear the suits off and, you know. They were warning me, be careful. This is too big for you. There were rumours related to something called a Super League project that would flip the power structures of the world's most popular sport. I'm the president of the most powerful sports organisation in the world. It's a community. The community. Community. It's a quasi-religion where we go to the stadium rather than the church. But this vast inequality has been growing for 10 years. Jeff, how's everything? Good. Good to meet you, Jim. Yeah, man, I'm I'm a long time football slash soccer fan. I didn't know there was more drama going on at some point behind the scenes. There was on the field, you know, uh, this is unbelievable. You, I mean, being a fan, so I, I knew about stuff. I would read articles. But I had no idea it was that deep. And and the relationships here that were happening. What surprised you the most, I guess, throughout this whole thing? Is there anything that really stood out? Because there's a lot of in a sense, shocking moments here when you see the, you know, especially the dynamics relationships, but what kind of like, even as a filmmaker and maybe as a curious fan or spectator that really surprised you in this process? I mean, the, the main thing is that it was unfolding publicly in real time. As you mm -hmm. know, as a fan, you know, it's, it's so rare that um, that these decisions get made anywhere but behind closed doors with a bunch of lawyers and contracts. And yeah. we usually don't get to lift open the hood and look at the machinery. And when this story leaked, it was even prior to the announcement of this coup d'etat attempt, this this European Super League. So you didn't know what either side had for artillery, what they had for weaponry, how they were going to attack. You didn't know who had the the, the advantage or the disadvantage. Um, and it really felt like the announcement of a war. And we were about to watch it play out publicly where they sort of tear the suits off and, you know, take the gloves off and go at it. <laughs> so I, I found that to be a real unique opportunity. And, you know, also that it was more than just businessmen making business decisions, that there were these big uh, emotional relationship turns, these allegiance mm -hmm. shifts. Um, you know, an example is in episode one, we've got two characters who are very close friends and they represent this alliance between these two opposing parties. They've sort of negotiated this peace treaty in the, the galaxy of football. Uh, one of them is the godfather to the other one's daughter. They went to right. the Vatican. That and, was surprising. Did, did the christening together. And then by the end of the episode, um, one of them, you know, from his standpoint, Alex Cheffrin would argue that Andrea Agnelli had betrayed him, had deceived him. And then in the next episode, we get to go back in time and see that from Andrea Agnelli's point of view. And he feels like the deception happened the other way around. Mm -hmm. early, right. And so there there's um there's these very human very dimensional ways of looking at guys that otherwise seem like these faceless strategists mechanically making legal decisions in the high tower you know is there villains and good guys here because it's i, I you gave everyone their chance to speak which i i love it, it's open to interpretation depends what you like i mean there might be fans that want a super league others that don't do you feel i, I thought you did as best as you could really kind of just let it out there and for the viewer to sort of decide but do you feel there was villains and you know heroes here in a sense one of the way what the main presentation that we gave to these various different club owners and government presidents and billionaires is that there won't be clear-cut villains mm -hmm. and heroes there won't be easy answers that said, you know, the strategy we're using is sort of a tug of war where maybe for 10 minutes or 15 or 20 minutes at a yeah. time, you may really root for one side and really understand their arguments. They may really persuade you. You may really identify with and sympathize with a character on that side, a subject on that side, a decision maker, a shot caller. And then for the next 15, 20 minutes, completely turn do a 180 and start rooting for and sympathizing and identifying with the opposite argument and somebody on the other side of the equation. So to answer your question, I think um, we do our best to uh, to make the strongest argument and be as persuasive as possible in these little chapters. But mm -hmm. by the end, 
once we keep dripping in layers of complexity and it all starts stacking up, I, you know, I hope that the the viewer understands that these are all flawed human um, subjects, much like you and I, much like any yeah. of the fans. And some of their solutions and some of their ideas may resonate more than others. Um, but it's it's more looking at the bigger questions through this lens, through this power saga, than it is having a, a prejudice towards one side or the other. Yeah, I found Alexander Sheffern to be a really interesting guy. I mean, we, we hear about in a sense of of he he keeps a low profile in a sense because you always see Gianni Infantino, who is the president of FIFA, kind of more publicly. But Alexander kind of keeps a lower profile in a sense. You don't see him as much, but he he's a very smart guy. But also it's his story here that we learn about him as an individual is really compelling too. And I'm thinking too, it had there's been a lot of FIFA corruption, as you know, uh, prior to it, but had this been another president at this time, would things probably or potentially turn different and, and result maybe the Super League would have happened had he not been in charge of UEFA? What do you kind of gather too from your you know analysis, what you've gathered too? Because I feel like as a viewer, like wow, this guy wasn't the guy. If it was someone else, maybe he could have been bullied differently or or maybe folded or something. But this guy was is really, he's rooted in his morals in such a way that he stayed through this and went into this fight in a sense. Yeah, I, mean, I, I it's impossible to speculate how things would have gone down with a different style of leadership. Um, and he has received a lot of praise for some of his strategic decisions. He took some big gambles. He decided to come out swinging. Um, he used language in some of his press conferences publicly um, that is just unheard of for presidents of you know yeah. bureaucratic and governing bodies, where he calls um, some of the Super League architects snakes and liars um, and says that they've spit on football. I mean, those are gambles, right? That's coming yeah. from the heart. You know, he's a lawyer by trade. Um, whether or not he was paying attention to it, he had to have known that there was risks in making threats like that. There were legal risks. And others would argue that he stepped into a trap, that he set himself up um, for uh, you know, this, this lawsuit calling UEFA a monopoly by making those threats. And um, you know, it's it's a it's really a, a trade-off. Like, are you going to trust that the court of public opinion will win out in the end, or are you going to trust that the court of legal opinion is going to win out in the end? And um, it's fascinating to see somebody take such a big swing and not play it diplomatically and really just go all in, right, and double down on his strategy. Um, and it's interesting, too, because like you said, Alex's arc is that he wasn't uh, initially thought of as a loud, opinionated um you know, voice in the in the football industry. He was sort of swept into power in 2016 yeah. in the aftermath of the 2015 FIFA UEFA corruption scandal as somebody that would kind of, uh, you know, clean up the, the act. Um, he's a lawyer by trade. And I don't think many people quite understood um, just how much personality he has. I mean, he's a guy who rides motorcycles through the desert. He's a black mm -hmm. belt karate. He uses that metaphor all the time in our interview where he's comparing his offensive versus defensive strategic choices in the Super League battle uh, with how he would defend or offend uh, in, in karate, in martial arts. So um, yeah, he, came, he really came out and publicly uh, owned th that that decision and would claim victory. You know, I was also curious for as a filmmaker, getting these people into a room or on camera. These are for some that might not realize these are very kind of elite people that don't do the necessary. They don't have to do press because they're kings of, in a sense, owning these federations or these clubs that they're, they're just mega clubs, you know, most profitable clubs and most worth, you know, valued clubs of any sports in the world to get them all on camera. I was so in a sense impressed that you actually got interviews and got them to speak about. And so many of these different people that you were able to land Did that was that a challenge for you in initially kind of going into this, like, Oh, am I going to get them on camera? Are they going to want to talk to me? That sort of thing, even getting time with them sort of thing. I'm curious how you approach that. Yeah, it was it was the hardest and most rewarding part of the process for sure. Um, my co-executive producer Connor Shell 
uh, and producer Libby Geist have amazing relationships in the sports world. In the weeks after the Super League saga played out on the world stage in, in April of 2021, we were on calls. We were on Zoom calls with many of these shot callers and decision makers. Um, and, you know, th there was a, a, a period of earning their trust and you know, reassuring them that we weren't going to uh, do gotcha journalism or biased journalism, that everybody was going to get a, a fair, balanced, deeply reported point of view. Um, but, you know, it went even further than that, because sitting down for an interview and presenting your case, that only goes so far. I mean, you have to really get into the personal stuff. Um, for for the rest of us to to understand um, something that otherwise could very easily just become like a you know a very heady essay on sports economics and mm -hmm. our goal here is to make this accessible and emotional and 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 fun and have forward movement at the same time that we're learning about the inner workings of one of the world's biggest industries. I think you did a tremendous job as a fan. I learned so much and I was sort of plugged in. I thought at least I was, you know, as a fan, but there's so much that goes on. And, and now you gain a different perspective, you know, on these clubs and the people that run them. It's it's for a fan of football and just in general, it, it's such an insightful piece to see how, you know, this industry works, you know, this this global phenomenon powerhouse uh, really operates on the people behind it. I thought you illustrated so well that it almost felt like an episode of Succession, you know, in a way too. So um, really well done all around, Jeff. Uh, this is fantastic. I have one episode to go. I kind of left one just to marinate, you know, sort of the, the first three. Uh, so I'm excited to finish it off, but fantastic work. I'm really glad you did this. Thanks so much, Jim. I really appreciate those kind words. Absolutely. Looking forward to what's next for you. All right, cool.